I'm Brad Neal. This is chemistry. Let's go. Uh, so we have talked about in class or video, whatever this is, uh, about bond dipole moments. Um, and we walked through that simulation about predicting bond character, yada, yada, yada. But we didn't necessarily tell you how to make bonds or what that looks like or any of that kind of thing. We just said, hey, if these things are already drawn, you should know what they do with this information. But how do you draw them for yourselves? That's where this idea, uh, that's where we need now various models to think about how molecules are going to form. First model we're going to talk about is the localized electron bonding model. Um, punchline, all of these are really just like all these different models are going to be constructs for us to think about how atoms are uh, oriented in space with respect to one another and to get uh, some crude approximation of how the electrons around atoms might be interacting with the electrons on other atoms and the nuclei on other atoms to form molecules. Um, so this is not going to be like a hard, fast, think explicitly about where this electron is because it's only going to be on this one place. This is going to just be a way for humans to communicate with other humans, um, humans, um, about where electrons might be and how molecules look. So it's a thought process. It's a thought technology. So this one is going to tell us that uh, specifically um, molecules are going to be composed of atoms uh, that are sharing electrons with one another. Um, and we're going to use the atomic orbitals of atoms to have the electrons get shared with one another. Um, the reason that they're sharing their electrons is because it's energetically favorable for an atom to have a filled valence shell. So that idea of core electrons versus valence electrons are coming into play. Um, because everything wants to have that full valence shell, it wants to get to the same electron configuration as a nearby um, noble gas. Um, so to get to that point, um, they're going to beg, borrow, plead, share, steal electrons, uh, in order to get to that filled valency is what we might call it. We're going to categorize our electrons into two different kinds. We're going to say lone pairs. Um, if you remember the classroom, we had, you remember that place where we all met? Oh, it was good times. Oh, those days. Um, we had a pair that was hanging up from the ceiling and it was all by itself. Insert the joke, a lone pair. Um, lone pairs are going to be pairs of electrons. They're going to be found localized on one particular atom. Um, they're not going to be electrons that are shared. We always put them in pairs because uh, think about that uh, spin up, spin down uh, thing we talked about with our quantum numbers. So the M sub S quantum number uh, electrons are in pairs and so we're going to have pairs of electrons written out around our atoms. Now if we find electrons that are in the space between atoms, um, electrons that are being shared between atoms, we're going to call these bonding pairs. So every uh, pair of electrons that we or every uh, bond that we're going to have between atoms is almost always going to be uh, made up of two electrons. So the way that we draw out this model uh, typically is with Lewis structures. Um, with a Lewis structure, we're going to be focusing just on the valence electrons. The core electrons are not going to be involved in bonding. Like I said before, our atoms are going to want a noble gas configuration, and that's because it's energetically more stable for atoms to be in. Um, can't stress this enough. For the atoms that are involved in a structure with a Lewis structure, you're only going to be using the valence electrons. So that's going to require you to remember how to figure out what, how many valence electrons each of your atoms have. So you're going to go on that periodic table, do the counting thing like we've talked about before. Um, we're not going to do those examples because they're really boring. 
and your book goes over those. But what we are going to do is go over the steps for writing a Lewis structure pretty quickly, and then we're going to start drawing out these Lewis structures. And I've got an example that's going to highlight all of these rules over here to the left. Um, so in quick order, and then we'll apply these. First, arrange your atoms uh, around the most electronegative or with the most electronegative atoms uh, as on the terminal positions. Put your most electropositive atom in the center. Um, you're going to count up all of your valence electrons from all of the atoms that you're working with. You're going to use pairs of electrons to form bonds between, to make as simple of bonding as possible between your terminal atoms and your central atoms. Um, you're going to remain. You're going to arrange any remaining electrons in a way that's going to satisfy the octet rule. And the octet rule is what is the formal name for that idea of uh, all atoms want eight electrons in their valency, and that's the whole thing of um, like we were saying previously. What we want to get a noble gas configuration. There's a few exceptions. Uh, first off, boron is totally cool with just having six valence electrons. Beryllium is good with having two, uh, four, four valence electrons. Uh, hydrogen is good with having two valence electrons. Um, if you are in a third row down or uh, heavier elements, um, you want that valence electron, uh, you want the valence electrons to be eight at least. And I say at least there because if you're in that third row or further down, you can have what's called an expanded octet. Uh, an expanded octet basically says not only do you have s and p orbitals, because the s orbitals would have two electrons, uh, the p, each of the p orbitals would have two electrons, so s plus p plus p plus p is eight total electrons, octet rule. If you throw the d electrons in there, you have five d electrons, so one, two, three, four, five d electrons, plus your uh, one, two, three P and then your four S or your S, not your four S, your S. So then you have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 electrons that you can place around any element that has a, um, that is in row three or lower on the periodic table. The reason that that is is because they have those d orbitals. Everybody wants at least eight, but if you have d orbitals, you can hold more than that. And that's what we're going to call an expanded octet. Um, so if we run into a situation where we have a bunch of extra electrons after we've got everybody's octet satisfied, we're going to put the extra electrons around atoms that can hold the extra electrons, namely those heavier elements. Now, anything in that second row is never going to exceed eight electrons. So if you've got an element that's in that second row on the periodic table, only, only ever going to have eight electrons. So you're only ever going to follow the octet rule. Okay, we're going to do a Lewis structure together now of carbonate, CO32 minus. And this is going to be a little bit more of an... Uh, a tricky example, but that's good because it's going to allow us to talk about a whole bunch of stuff. So let's begin. All right. Groovy. And then so the molecule of interest is going to be carbonate. And I'm going to pick a different color. So CO32 minus. All right. Let's go back to that rule set. All right, so here's our rules above my fat head. First, arrange atoms with the most electronegative atoms at the terminal. So look at what you got. You got carbon, you got oxygen. If you go in your periodic table, which of these, which of these two kinds of atoms are, is going to be the more electropositive atom? Carbon. Carbon, yeah, because it's further left on the periodic table. So carbon is going to go in the center, and we want to put the electronegative atoms in terminal positions. Well, what's a terminal position? It means a position that is at the end 
Um, so something like this is pretty good. So we've got our oxygens around our carbon. Now we need to sum up all, okay, while we're there at number one, um, notice where it says uh, place them around the most electropositive atom. It would not be a good idea to do something like this where we put everything in a line. Um, and that's because our carbon here is not in the center. And these two oxygens right here are not going to be terminal oxygens. If we can have all those electronegative atoms be uh, terminal, that would be great. So we're going to try to do something more like what we have drawn uh, up here in the first time. Time to sum our balance electrons. So we've got one carbon, four electrons. If you don't remember the four electron thing is, just go on the periodic table, count over how many groups you are. Carbon's going to have four balance electrons. Oxygen's going to have six, but we've got three of them. So three times six is 18 plus four, 22, right? 22 total. Electron. Okay. Groovy. All right. This is where we're now going to go to step three. Use a pair of electrons to form a bond between each pair of atoms. So that line that I just drew, each line is going to be designating a bond. Each bond we're going to say is worth two electrons. We drew three bonds for six electrons. So we need to subtract the six bonding electrons from our 22 total. And 22 minus six is, gosh, 16? Hopefully. We have 16 electrons left. Groovy. Now it's time to do some counting. Right now, our carbon here has two, four, six valence electrons around it. It wants eight. So it's got two less, or it's missing two. Our oxygens, each of these, they all have the exact same chemical environment only have two electrons around them from those bonds. Now you may be thinking that that's double counting, like the bond, the electrons around the, that we just counted for the carbon shouldn't count for the oxygen. They should count for the oxygen because we're saying that they're shared. That's the idea behind this modeling. So those electrons get to count for the carbon and they get to count for the oxygen. So each oxygen is going to have a total of Two, two valence electrons. So, step four, arrange remaining electrons to satisfy the octet rule. Well, let's do this thing. I'm going to try to, whoops, not do that. I'm going to try to erase these red lines because I think it's going to get a little confusing. <laughs> okay. Time to spend these other 16. Here's how we do this. We're going to drop a pair of electrons at a time around our atoms. And every time we do that, we want to subtract the number of electrons that we've spent. So we dropped two, gives us 14 remaining. What advantage does this give us? Well, this oxygen down here now has two from the bond Plus, it has the two lone pair for a total of four electrons around it. Still deficient, one's eight. So, we can drop another pair and another pair. By doing that, we dropped four total in that maneuver. We have ten electrons remaining. Groovy. Can we do the same thing for the others? Well, sure, right? <laughs> So, did we do math right? Feels like we did math right. 
Yeah. Groovy. Uh, da, 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 da. Yep. Let's just do that. One, two, three, four, five, six. We spent six electrons. We have four electrons remaining. One, two, three, four. Well, that's not very good. Not very good because we don't have enough electrons that are spent. Or I'm sorry, we don't have enough electrons around our oxygen. So, so far, the placing of the electrons and the bonding make sense. Yep. Cool. So the couple of notes here. Um, first off, I started placing electrons around our terminal oxygen atoms. You notice I did not start forming bonds between the oxygens themselves. The reason I didn't form the, and what I'm saying here is, I didn't do something like this. I didn't create uh, a bond like that between two oxygens. The reason I didn't do that is because this angle right here is not cool uh, in terms of chemistry. It doesn't, that's a really sharp or I mean acute angle um, and that it puts a lot of strain on the um, molecule and you very seldomly find chemicals that have three uh, membrane rings. So the members would be the three atoms. So three atom rings. Um, because it's energetically unfavorable, that would make drawing bonds like that not the right thing to do if you can help it at all. So that's why I didn't draw that. That's why I immediately started dropping out those uh, electrons around the oxygens. Okay. If we start counting up stuff now, let's double check our work first. And let's make sure that we actually have all of the electrons on our structure that we think are what we started with total. The reason I say that let's count up our electrons is because this oxygen out here doesn't have a full valency. And before we start doing fancy math, maybe we just did math wrong. Um, and by fancy math, I mean start changing our structure around a whole bunch. Let's just double check to make sure that we even have the right number of electrons drawn out. So here we go. 2, 4, 6, 8... 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22. Okay, so we've got our 22 electrons here. Still, so as far as like the electron counting is concerned, looks like we did a good job because we came up here at the very beginning and we said that our carbon gave us four our oxygen each of them gave us six go back now if you would to our original compound the co3 two minus two minus what does a two minus mean on an ion it's gonna have negative like more electrons it's going to have more electrons. Yeah, this is an anion. It's got more electrons. How many more electrons? Two. Two. Yeah. It just Did so happens to be exactly what we need. Yeah, we didn't account for this two right here in any of our counting right over here. All we took into consideration were just the atoms themselves. So what we should have done up here is add two more electrons to our initial total because we have an anion and anions have extra electrons. What would have happened if this would have been a cation? Let's say it was a positive two. It would have been 20 electrons. 
it would have had 20 electrons. Yeah, we would have had to remove two electrons from our total right there. That's right. Exactly right. So first lesson upon this kind of structure. The rules work, but you have to stay cognizant of what your chemical environment actually is. In this case, it's an anion, so we added two electrons. So our total really wasn't 22, our total was really 24. And a nice thing here, excuse me, if you forget to do that, as long as you do like what we did at the uh, end and we double checked our structure versus how many electrons we had counted out, your memory might get jogged. So lesson, what lesson one, make sure you count all of your electrons. Lesson two, double check your work as you go along. Because if you make an error towards the beginning, um, if you wait until the very end to catch that error, to double check your work and catch that error, it's going to be harder to figure out what happened. But as you go along with these various steps, if you double check, life gets better. So if we had 24 up here at the beginning, we really wouldn't have had 16, we'd have had 18. We wouldn't have had 14, we would have had 16. We wouldn't have had 10, we would have had... Thanks, 12. Good grief. We wouldn't have had four, we'd have had six, and we wouldn't have had zero. We would have had two electrons remaining. And then we could have put a lone pair right out there on that last oxygen. And then we would have had zero electrons remaining. And now, if we go and do our counting, we will have, oops, we will have really gone off the rails, we would have 24 electrons all placed out on our structure. That is a good thing. So if you count up all those green areas, it's 24 total electrons. Problem. We got a problem. That problem is if we count this up, this oxygen has eight valence. This oxygen has eight valence. This oxygen has eight valence. What about the carbon? Six. Six electrons. Yo. We need to get to eight. How do we get to eight? Moon of the pair from the oxygen bond with the carbon yeah we can take one of our lone pairs off of an oxygen and we can form what's called a double bond now sometimes uh, i meant to say this earlier sometimes people are going to put dots sometimes people are going to put x's to denote electrons and then sometimes people will just put a full on line like I just drew and the line is supposed to denote uh, two electrons as a lone pair the X's in, um, are easier to see on a chalkboard instead of dots I'm not going to use X's or lines I'm just got bad or got habits of using um dot and they're not that hard to hopefully see the way I'm drawing them but if you go into other classes you might see that kind of thing that's just an FYI all right so this is now our structure what's the advantage here well this oxygen has eight valence electrons. It's got two, four, six, eight. Each lone pair, each bonding pair counts as two electrons. This both of these oxygens here on the far right are in the same or the right of the structure are in the same chemical environment. So we've got two, four, six, eight. Two, four, six, 
eight. I say they're the same chemical environment because they have the same kind of uh, electron spacing around them. That's the parlant. And now our carbon is going to have two from each of the green lines and two from each of the blue lines for a total of eight valence electrons. So this is cool. This is cool. We have now satisfied all of the stuff for our octet rule, for our structure. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Okay. There's this thing, though, that we need to talk about called formal charge. Um, and this is the definition of formal charge above my head. Uh, the number of valence electrons from the periodic table minus the number of electrons around the atom in the Lewis structure. Why does this matter? What is a formal charge? A like formal charge is a way for us as human beings to communicate to one another chemical properties um, based off of these really simplistic models that we're drawing, like over here. Because it's simplistic compared to what's really happening around an atom. What's really happening around an atom is something more like that uh, electrostatic potential map that we showed with respect to polarity. Because most people don't want to draw an electrostatic potential map, um, we have to figure out another way of denoting which side of atoms are more negatively charged than others, especially if something's polar. Hopefully, that even if you don't recognize with the structure that's in the box, uh, immediately whether something's polar or not, I'm hoping that you're noting the stuff in the blue on that structure looks different from the stuff in the green. So if we use the Sesame Street test of one of these things is not like the other, one of these things is not the same, um, this does not pass at the Sesame Street test because there's something different. That means we need to investigate. The way we're going to investigate is formal charges. I'm going to redraw all that structure in a hot second. All right. We're going to apply that definition of formal charge to our potential structure. One thing I strongly suggest that you do with formal charge is go on your structure and denote, especially if you have the exact same kind of atom, uh, label them. And I just put a one, two, and three here because now I can come over and I can write out formal charge of oxygen one. And I can denote how what it's what that atom's formal charge is versus the formal charge of two and three. Now, because two and three are in the same chemical structure, they're going to have the same formal charge. We'll get there. But we know that it should be different from one, or we think it might be different from one because of the Sesame Street test. So number of valence electrons from the periodic table, oxygen had six. Number of electrons around the atom in the Lewis structure. Okay, we have two lone pairs. Each lone pair has two electrons in there for a total of four. That four is coming from the lone pair. Now we have a double bond. Each one of the bonds are going to have two electrons in them. So you would think, oh, it's going to be four. It's not going to be four. It's going to be two. Only one of the electrons from each of the bonds will count. So the first bond will give us one electron that belongs to the oxygen. The second bond, only one uh, electron from that bond will belong to the oxygen. So to maybe highlight that, the thing here in green, will, even though there's two electrons in that bond, only one of them is going on the oxygen. In the blue, there's two electrons in that bond, only one of them is going on the oxygen. So that's going to give us a total of one plus one because the blue one versus the green one. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. 
So that's how we count the total number of electrons around an atom in the structure. So six minus six in most countries is equal to zero. So our formal charge on oxygen one is gonna be zero. Formal charge on oxygen two and three well, six is still going to be the valence electron from the periodic table. Now, if we start counting stuff up, we've got two, four, six, seven. Which gives us a negative one for the formal charge on oxygen two and oxygen three. Formal charge on carbon is going to be four from the periodic table, and one from each of its bonds. It has four bonds around it. So four, zero. You're still like, what has this got to do with anything? All right, there's that negative one. There's a negative one here, and there's a negative one here. What that negative one is telling us is that um, it's a formalism for us to describe that there is more uh, electron. A way to think about it is there's more electron uh, electrostatic potential on those atoms. The electrons are spending more time in the molecule around those atoms. There's a bigger electron density around those atoms that have a negative formal charge. If we have a positive formal charge, then the electrons aren't spending as much time around those atoms. So if you think back to the electrostatic potential map, there were the blue regions and the red regions, and we said red had more electron density. If we drew an electrostatic potential map for this molecule, or I'm sorry, this ion, we would expect red to be around these two oxygens. And we would think the blue would then be on the areas that are zero. Another cool thing, our total formal charge is equal to two. What was the charge on our ion? Two minus. Two minus. Our formal charge should always equal the charge on the ion. It's a nice little formalism. This is another self check that we can use to make sure that we're doing stuff right. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. Groovy. Okay, we've got one more thing on this screen called resonance. Now, resonance, um, get my head out of the way. There we go. Resonance is an accurate description of the electron distribution within a molecule. Translation. We go back up to our drawing way over here. Why did we put a double bond around ox from oxygen one to carbon? Why didn't we put a double bond between oxygen two to carbon? or a double bond between oxygen three and carbon. And I'm not saying why didn't we just add extra double bonds. If we added extra double bonds, then carbon would have too many valence electrons around it. It would have more than the octet, which is not possible for carbon because it's in row two. So why didn't we put, why didn't we put the double bond in one of these other locations? Excuse me. Well, there's really no reason that we didn't. We could draw out. or we could draw out or we could draw out where we've got oxygen one 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 two 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 three 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 that double bond could have existed at any of these and in fact what we find out is because not one of these is more correct than the other, they're all equally valid. And what I'm doing right now is I'm putting brackets behind, around them because I'm going to show you a cheat way to do this faster. It's not really a cheat. It's just like a fast way of doing this, but only you only should do it after you've got an idea of why you're doing it. By putting the bracket there and then I put a two minus up here at the top, I'm denoting to my reader that this overall structure has a negative two formal charge or a negative two charge. 
I'm just not putting, I'm not going through and putting the charge on the specific atom. So the bracket is just saying, hey, this charge is kind of nebulously placed around here. By putting the structure in brackets, by putting the arrows the way that I have, I am now indicating this molecule has resonance. So all three of these structures over a meow could have been drawn. They're all equal in their validity. So what we would find in reality is that a molecule is not going to pick one of these structures and stay like that. It's going to say, well, if I can be like any of these structures, I'm just going to constantly rotate my electron density around because it's perfectly legal. I can have the double one here. I can have the double one here. I can have the double one here. If we do spectroscopy uh, where we measure the bond lengths, um, in the real world, what we find is not a measurement where we find two single bond carbon oxygen lengths and one double bond oxygen length. We really find a like carbon oxygen one and a third bond. We only really find one bond length. And that's because that double bond is just rotating around so quickly that instead of a formal double bond and single bonds ever actually really forming. It just kind of has this like amalgam. So a better, best way to draw out this structure, because we now have checked for resonance, we drew a proper Lewis structure, would be to draw something like this, where the dotted lines mean a partial bond. And show this over here. Person on the left. Nope. Great. Here's a couple of drawings of the molecule. So here's our resonance structures like we drew. Or I'm sorry. Yeah, here's like our uh, structure like we drew. Here are the possible resonance structures for our carbonate. But down here is this summary of what the molecule would probably look like. So we don't ever truly have a neg fully negative charge on an oxygen and one oxygen with a zero formal charge. What we really end up with is these like partial two third negative charges all around our carbonate. I would expect you to be able to draw at a minimum the stuff that's in this row and using these arrows to denote the fact that you know that resonance exists with molecules like this. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is pretty much beginning to end how you do Lewis structures. Um, we talked about a bunch of different nuances. So we talked about the rules and we talked about the nuances. We also talked about how to check them with respect to counting your electrons. And we talked about how to check them with respect to formal charges and to check that your structure doesn't have resonance on there. Do you have any questions? Nope. Gribby. That is going to be that because the next thing uh, is just a, another example. And I could just keep drawing examples all the live long day. Me drawing out a bunch of examples is not going to go as well as you drawing out some practice problems for yourself and then having questions and getting those questions answered. Um, I would suggest that if you um, want some more video guidance, check out the discussion section that we put out regarding Lewis structures. Uh, it's more examples of this kind of stuff. If you watch that video and you're like, where is that coming from? Um, watch this video, rewatch it again, then watch that video and it'll probably make a lot more sense. But that's what we're going to cover for today. I feel like I can take on any Lewis structure now. Not really, but I feel pretty good about it. So the... The, um, if you're looking for like that, are you up for a challenge? Nope. 
Come on. There we go. If you're looking for a challenge, now do something like SF6. Because if you can do SF6 and SF6 makes sense, you're going to be in really good shape when we talk about Vesper structures uh, and the next video to come out. Okay. I will try that one. Cool. Um, if you're looking, because if you're a person who's saying, like, I want more practice, one, uh, your book, two, literally take any of our polyatomic ions and try to draw out the Lewis structure for those polyatomic ions. That's a really good practice. Because if you can draw out the Lewis structures for those polyatomics, you're, um, it means that you know the rules. Because the, the polyatomics aren't... Um, they are not the world's most complicated examples, but they are appropriately complicated. And if you seriously go through that list of polyatomics I asked you to memorize at the beginning of the semester and you can draw those I really don't think there's going to be anything I can do to stop you and the answers for all those polyatomics are readily available all over the interwebs but I wouldn't start with the answers I'd start with the your work first 